Hey everyone, I'm Mike Sattel, the founder of Sattel Tutoring and the author of the SAT Packets Study Guides. In this lesson, we're going to take a comprehensive look at the strategy for the SAT reading section. We'll talk about some of the big picture ideas that are important for everyone and some of the more subtle rules that can help you turn a good score into a great score. But before we begin, let's make sure you're prepared for the lesson. If you've already purchased a copy of my SAT Reading and Writing Packet Study Guide, then you already have this lesson. It's the first one in the book. Just use the table of contents to find the page for the SAT Reading Strategy. If you don't yet have a copy of my SAT Study Guide, then you can still follow along. Just download the free workbook from my website, sateltutoring.com. It's a great way to test out my study guide. And if you like the lesson, please go to amazon.com and purchase a copy. It'll help you improve your scores, and it supports me so that I can make more of my materials available for free. You can also support me by following me on Instagram for daily practice questions, subscribing to my YouTube channel for video explanations of the official practice tests, and now you can check out my subreddit to ask me questions as you use my study guides and prep for the SAT. And all of this and more can be found on my website, sateltutoring.com. Now let's get to the lesson. And before we start, I just want to ask that you don't get ahead of me. A lot of this lesson is about getting rid of your old bad habits and replacing them with new habits that will help you get a new score. If you just dive into the questions, you'll end up reinforcing your bad habits. I'll give you plenty of opportunities to pause the video and try the questions on your own, but I want you to move at my pace. Okay. A typical reading passage will have 10 or 11 questions that generally match the ones I have here. My students often ask me whether they should read the questions before they read the passage. The idea, I guess, is that memorizing the questions will help you notice the answers when you come upon them as you read. This strategy might make sense on an ACT, but I don't think you need to read the questions first on the SAT for a few different reasons. First, a lot of the SAT questions will be about big ideas, not specific facts. In other words, the answers won't be hidden in one tiny line. They'll be repeated in multiple sentences, or they'll be about the overall structure of the passage. That's not the kind of stuff that needs to be memorized. But also, the SAT tends to give you line references for the majority of questions, so there's nothing to search for. The questions will tell you where to look. Now, there will be a few exceptions, like number six, which does ask a narrow fact and does not give you a line reference. But one of the big ideas we're going to talk about in this lesson is that we shouldn't design our strategy around the exceptions. If a rule works 85% of the time, that's a huge win. I'll show you ways of dealing with the exceptions, but we shouldn't throw away a good strategy just because it occasionally fails. So if we're not reading the questions first, then should we read the passage first? Well, it depends. If you're already scoring in the 700s and you understand what you read and you're not running out of time, then I don't want to mess with a good thing. The rest of this lesson will help you pick up those last few points, but what you're doing is already working, so you shouldn't change it completely. But for most people, the reading section is a huge source of frustration. Your score doesn't improve, you keep running out of time, or you barely understand the passages. You need to change your habits or you're not going to change that score. And that's why I suggest that you try what I call the no reading strategy. This is what I teach my students. This is what I use myself when I take SATs. I do not read the passages. I just go right into answering the questions. This is very controversial. I get hate mail over this, but I promise you that it works. For one, it lets you narrow your focus to just a few lines of the passage at a time so that you're not trying to memorize and understand the entire passage at once. It also saves time, the way I see it, if you're spending five minutes reading each passage but barely understanding what you've read, then you're just throwing 25 minutes of every reading section away. Why waste that time if all it gets you is frustration? I'd rather you spend 25 more minutes fumbling through the questions because the questions are actually worth points. You don't get points for reading the passage. In fact, you can actually lose points for reading the passage because the SAT loves to create trap answer choices that only sound good if you've read the whole thing. A common example is that a wrong answer will use a fact from the end of the passage to answer a question about the beginning of the passage. You can't do that, and not reading prevents that mistake. But I'll admit that the no reading strategy has some drawbacks. 
What if by not reading you miss something important? It could happen. Plus, not reading is scary. You're just not used to this way of doing things, but I'm going to ask you to trust me. For the rest of this lesson, I'm going to show you what it would feel like to go through a passage without actually reading the passage. You'll notice that my workbook doesn't look like a typical reading lesson with a passage followed by a bunch of questions. Instead, I've cut and pasted the parts that we need so that you aren't tempted to read more than is absolutely necessary for each question. And look, even if you decide that this strategy isn't for you and you continue to read the passages, we'll still cover crucial ideas that can help with the hardest questions. There's something in this lesson for everyone. And the first two strategies are true for everyone, whether you read the passages or not. First, everyone must read the blurb before the passage. In this case, all we really learn is that Jane Eyre is probably the main character and that the passage might be hard to understand because it's old. But sometimes the title of the passage gives us the main idea, especially for the science passages. And the blurb usually tells us something about the relationship between the double passages. The blurb might also give us an essential definition or fact that we can't answer the question without. Always read the blurb. But then we can skip the rest of the passage and start on the questions. The first question will almost always be about the whole passage. It'll say something like, over the course of the passage. Well, if we're using the no reading strategy, then we obviously can't answer this question because we haven't read the passage. But even if we do read the passage, we should still save whole passage questions for last. The SAT likes to trick us into answering these questions first when we have the least information about the passage. But as we answer the other nine questions, we're going to get a much better sense of what this passage is about. We'll read and reread most of the text, so we'll be better qualified to answer whole passage questions after we've answered everything else. Question two we can answer. The vast majority of SAT reading questions will have a line reference. In this case, we're told to read the first paragraph. Now this may seem kind of obvious, but I want to make sure we understand the order of operations. For pretty much every reading question, we need to follow the QLC method. First we read the question, then we go to the line reference, then we look at the answer choices. The key piece here is that we don't want to look at the answer choices before we read the lines because we might get biased and pick a trap answer that matches our own beliefs but isn't supported by the lines. To force you to follow the QLC method, I've cut together the question and lines so that you see everything in the right order. Question, line reference, choices. Now pause the video, try this question on your own, and unpause when you're ready for the answer. This question probably wasn't so hard. Most people confidently pick choice A, which is correct. But I want to use this easy question to help us put in place the habits that we'll need for the harder questions. Most people pick A simply because it feels right. We could dig a little deeper and ask, what character does it introduce? The answer is pretty obviously John Reed, and most of the paragraph is giving us information about him. But I also want to examine the wrong answers. Did you actually prove that they were wrong, or was it mostly that choice A felt more right? For example, choice B seems like it might work. The paragraph is clearly written in past tense, so that kind of matches with historical context. But actually, historical context is more like background information about the time period we're talking about. So like who's the king of England at the time, or what wars were going on. This paragraph isn't looking broadly, it's just about John Reed. Choice C also seems kind of right, though. Do they talk about education? Absolutely. The paragraph says he's a schoolboy and it talks about him not being at school, so education seems right. But the problem is more with the word merits. The merits of education would be if they talked about why education in general is good. But again, this is just about John Reed's education. It's much more narrow. Choice D is tricky. As we said, they're definitely talking about the past because a lot of the paragraph is in past tense. So then what makes this choice wrong? Most students just tell me that choice A sounded better, and I get that, but harder questions will have multiple choices that sound pretty good. We need to get in the habit of noticing what makes them different and wrong. In this case, the problem is the word event. We have to pay attention to that word's definition. An event is a moment in time with a specific location and date. This paragraph is definitely talking about the past, 
But it's not about a specific moment where John Reed missed school or gorged himself. In this case, it's not narrow. The paragraph is talking about the past more generally. And look, I get that you probably sensed all of this just by reading the lines and the choices, and that you didn't need to inspect every word of every choice. But if you want to change your score, you're going to need to start inspecting. You've been using process of elimination for a long time. You go through the choices, pick the one you like, and eliminate the ones you don't. That seems pretty standard. But the SAT is a new kind of test, and you need a new way of sorting through these answer choices. What we just did was eliminate individual words, not entire choices, and that is a crucial distinction. When you cross out whole choices and pick the one you like best, you're mostly trusting your instincts. You're picking the choice that feels most right. The problem with that on the SAT is that they purposely set traps by making choices 90% right so that your brain is attracted to them. But if a choice is 10% wrong, it's 100% wrong. We need to train our brains to find the 10%. So now we're going to look at the individual words and phrases, and plenty of them will still be right. But we're trying to get better at noticing the 10% that are wrong so that we don't fall for traps. The most important thing you can do to help your brain use this new strategy is show your work. Hopefully you're already circling the right answers and crossing out the wrong ones, but you also need to get in the habit of underlining the words and phrases that make choices wrong. It leaves a record so that you can better understand why you get questions wrong, and it forces you to narrow your focus and think about the small things that you would normally ignore. Question three is definitely harder. You'll see that we're still using the QLC method, and this time we're told to read lines one through seven. But I also included an extra sentence, and this is another important rule that we should follow whether we're using the no reading strategy or not. Whenever they give you a line reference in the question, you should read plus one sentence before and after where they tell you to because they sometimes put the answer in these extra sentences. In this case, we're at the beginning of the passage, so there's no sentence before, but I gave you the sentence after. Now pause the video, show your work on the page, and unpause when you're ready for the answer. This one probably felt harder. If it didn't, you might have fallen for a trap. Most people confidently eliminate choice A right away. For one, the lines aren't some warning about whether you should eat unhealthy foods. This is what I call a bumper sticker choice, because it's a nice phrase that nobody would really disagree with, but it's irrelevant to the passage. Remember, don't base your answers on your own beliefs. We can also say that choice A is wrong because it's not about children in general. It's about one specific child, John Reed. Sometimes more than 10% of an answer is wrong. Choice B feels pretty good. Are they talking about John's physical attributes? For sure. He's large and stout, has dingy and unwholesome skin, large extremities. I don't know what bilious means, but I can tell it's something physical. But that's the 90% that's right. Is the narrator concerned with John Reed's physical attributes? Absolutely. But is she only concerned with his physical attributes? No. She talks about his age and his schooling and his delicate health. The word only is the 10%. It's enough to make the other 90% not matter and to make the entire choice wrong. And speaking of delicate health, choice D matches with that idea very nicely. It seems like they're talking about an illness, and as we've already said, it seems to affect his appearance. But again, that's the 90%. The mom says he has delicate health, but that's a big leap to say that he has a chronic illness. He's not in an iron lung or a hospital bed. We don't have the evidence to support that kind of strong word. In fact, strong words that carry a lot of meaning, like only and chronic, are a big problem on the SAT. They can be easy to miss because your brain is so excited about the rest of the choice being right that it doesn't notice that these words aren't supported by the lines. And it's tricky because not all strong words are wrong. We still need to apply the same process of elimination to choice C. Is there a behavior? Yes, he gorges himself. Does Jane witness it? Probably, she's describing it in detail, so that's a reasonable assumption. But does she witness it repeatedly? Repeatedly is a strong word. It has a very specific meaning that we need to justify with the lines. In this case, though, we can see that John gorges himself habitually. It's like a habit, something you do repeatedly. Choice C is the answer because we can prove the strong words right. The big takeaway is that your brain is not used to noticing strong words. 
we need to train it to start picking them out. Let's look at these short sentences. Pause the video and circle the word that makes the sentences stronger. Okay, for number one, most is stronger. Most means more than half, so we would need evidence that more than half of the scientists believe the theory. Some is weaker. It could mean that just like three guys believe it. Same thing for number two, all means literally everyone. Many just means a lot. The problem is that we use strong words much more flexibly in our daily lives. For example, if someone asked you, hey, how was the party? You might say, oh my god, it was amazing. Everybody was there. Really? Everybody was there? Literally every single person? In real life, nobody cares, but on the SAT, words mean what they mean. For number three, only if is strong for the same reason it was before. In this case, it makes it seem like the only thing that could sink the ship is a broken pump. Number four is important because there are a lot of science passages on the SAT. Confirms is stronger because it means that the hypothesis has been proven without any doubt. Proof is hard to come by in science and on the SAT. More often we have evidence that supports a theory, but not definitive proof. In number five, argues that is stronger because it implies that the author of the article is taking a side. Sometimes the author will pick a side, but other times the author merely presents other people's opinions. On the SAT, you need to pay attention to those kinds of differences. But your brain is going to make that harder. In fact, the most interesting part of this sentence is Ned is the killer. That's where my brain goes. But we need to force our brains to inspect words that we would normally ignore. As I said, your brain likes the 90% of a choice that's right. It's attracted to it like a moth to a flame. You need to train your brain to find the 10% that's wrong. And for so many of the strategies we're talking about, the main thing to remember is that we want to narrow our focus. The whole point of the no reading strategy is that we aren't cramming our brain with unnecessary information so that we can instead focus on the small stuff that actually matters. We use process of elimination to inspect each choice. We show our work to narrow our focus to individual words including the strong words that we might otherwise ignore. Moving on to number four, we've got a bit of a problem. This question does not have a line reference. We haven't read the passage, so how do we know where to look? Well, whenever a question has no line reference, the first thing you should do is look at the next question, because they're almost always an evidence pair. In this case, the choices for number five give us the line references for number four. Before we dive into the question, I need to go into more detail about the plus one sentence rule. As I said before, when we have a line reference in the question, we always need to read a sentence before and a sentence after the line reference. But for evidence questions where the line references are in the choices, we can usually just read the lines they tell us. The short version of why is that when we're asked about a line reference, we're usually being asked for the purpose and thus need the context. But when the line reference is supposed to be evidence, then the lines themselves need to give the answer. For this pair, we still need to use the QLC method. In fact, doing so makes these pairs much easier. First, we read the question, and we need to make sure we understand what we're looking for. In this case, why is John Reed not currently at school? Then we skip down to the line references, which are actually given in question five. Here, I gave you only what we're told to read, not the plus one sentence. Pause the video, read through the lines, and then we'll talk about them. Okay, so line reference A talks about school a little, but it doesn't actually answer the question and tell us why he's not there. We can confidently cross this one out. Line reference B also talks about school, and it seems to explain why he's not there, on account of his delicate health. Of course, we can't just pick this yet, we need to read all of the others. Line reference C is a little weird. They talk about the master, who I guess is the principal of the school, and maybe they give a reason why he's not there, over application. But honestly, this is a confusing line reference, and that's okay. We don't need to fully understand everything all the time. But since it feels kind of related, I'm not going to eliminate it yet. Line reference D, on the other hand, seems completely random, so I feel more confident getting rid of it. At this point, most people would just pick B and move on. But I'm going to ask you to hold off on picking an answer. That's not our goal during this step of the process. 
we really just want to eliminate any line references that are totally random and unrelated. But if something is kind of related, we should keep an open mind and keep it in the mix. It's okay to have a favorite, like for line reference B, but don't get too attached to it because we still need to look at the choices. In fact, most of the time, I have two or three line references left after this step of the process, and that is totally okay. Now, as you can see, these pairs involve some jumping around. We first read the question for number four, then we jump down to five for the line references, then go back up to four for the choices. We can still use process of elimination to sort through the answers. Again, pause the video and try to pick a pair of answers for four and five. Okay, hopefully you quickly eliminated choice A because it never says he's too old, and choice D because it never talks about him being bullied. Choice B seems right because we can match medical attention with delicate health. But choice C also matches because both line references talk about his mother. Both choices also have strong words that we need to support with the lines. Once again, constant medical attention is a huge leap from delicate health. We just don't have any evidence that he's in a hospital bed near death. So, is he spoiled by his mother? Well, line reference C says his mom is sending him cakes and sweetmeats, whatever those are. She also denies that the cakes are the problem and thinks John is tired and misses home. Even if we don't understand every word of this, there's a lot of evidence that he's spoiled. In fact, this happens a lot where you don't understand the lines until you read a choice and start looking for an idea in those lines. That's perfectly okay, and that's why we need to have an open mind when we read things we don't quite understand right away. Narrowing our focus to words in the choices can give us a key that might unlock the lines for us. It's also why we don't want to automatically pick our favorite line reference right away. Sometimes the choices prove us wrong. In this case, people often get so fixated on line reference B that it blinds them to the strong word constant in choice B, and they end up getting two questions wrong. If we're flexible and use process of elimination, we can avoid the traps and pick the right answers. Question six poses another problem. Once again, we have no line reference, so we look ahead to the next question. But this time, it's not an evidence pair. This is a true no line reference question, and they're what make the no reading strategy difficult. Now, we could just skim the passage for something about bullying, but there's a better way. We're going to use the chronology rule. SAT reading questions are generally in chronological order, meaning that they go in the order that the answers appear in the passage. So if we don't have a line reference, we can use surrounding questions to help us guess where to read. Most tutors do not teach this strategy, yet it's one of the main reasons that we can get away with not reading the passage. In this case, we know that the answer for number 5 was lines 10 to 16, and looking ahead, we see that number 7 is about line 41. So we should guess that the answer to number 6 is probably between lines 16 and 41. Now, this doesn't always work. Sometimes the SAT breaks the chronology rule. But this is what I meant before when I said that we shouldn't choose our strategies based on the exceptions. The chronology rule works about 85% of the time, which is good enough to use it as a starting point. And if we can't find the answer in the chronological lines, we can always read more. That's the best part of the no reading strategy. We start by not reading, and then only read the lines we're told to. But we can always read more if that's not enough. There's nothing preventing us from adapting to the situation when we hit a weird question. But for now, let's just stick to lines 17 to 42, which would have been the beginning and end of these whole paragraphs. Pause the video, follow the QLC method, show your work, and pick an answer. Okay, now some people read these lines, find the answer right away, and then think the answer is pretty obvious. We should still go through process of elimination, though, because sometimes questions feel easy, but we're falling into a trap without realizing it. Plus, if you don't understand the lines, you can use the choices to help you get some meaning out of them. In this case, the wrong answers are relatively easy to get rid of. She's not too preoccupied with reading because it doesn't really mention reading at all. Choice C is a bumper sticker choice. Of course violence is immoral, but Jane never actually says that. We don't know what her beliefs are, and we're not allowed to assume. 
Choice D is wrong because we don't have any injuries until the end, and it never says she's too weak to fight. Choice B has some words that we should test, but they all pass the test. Do the lines talk about adults? Yes, they mention the servants and Mrs. Reed. And are the adults unwilling to discipline John? Well, they don't say it exactly like that, but there's lots of evidence. Jane has no appeal, the servants don't want to offend John, and Mrs. Reed is blind and deaf, which of course isn't literal, she just ignores John's bullying. So as you can see, the no line reference exception doesn't actually make the no reading strategy all that much harder. In fact, no line reference questions tend to be easier once you know where to look, because the answer isn't usually as disguised as it can be for other questions. That's why the chronology rule is so helpful. It narrows our focus to a smaller piece of the passage, making it more likely that we find the no line reference answer. We still have one more question type to deal with, vocabulary. And it's just as important that we continue to follow the QLC method. First, read the questions so that you know what word they're asking for. Then, go to the line reference. But when you read the sentence, pretend the word is a blank. I removed it for you this time. Your goal is to come up with your guess for what could fit in the blank. We're not trying to guess the actual answer. We just want a placeholder so that we have a decent sense of what they mean. Usually there are lots of clues that can help you fill the blank. It's okay to steal words from other parts of the sentence. How about, I tottered, and on regaining my equilibrium, tottered back a step or two from his chair? Or maybe she stepped back a step or two. It's not poetry to be that repetitive, but we're not trying to be clever. We're trying to capture the meaning. And if some other part of the sentence is already capturing the meaning, then steal it. We could also come up with an original word if we think of one. How about she fell back a step or two? Once we have our guess, we can look at the choices and pick the answer that is closest to our guess. In this case, retreated is essentially the same as fell back. So why go through all this trouble? Well, the SAT loves to use vocab questions to set traps for you. If they had simply asked you to define the word retired, you would probably have picked something like choice A because you retire from a job or resign a position, or maybe D because if you retire to bed, you go to sleep. The SAT loves to ask for the definitions of common words that are used in uncommon ways. By ignoring the choices and going to the line reference first, we're significantly decreasing the chance that we fall for a trap. It's tempting to look at those choices first, but don't do it. Now that we've looked at all the question types, let's finish up the passage. Pause the video and work through questions 8, 9, and 10. Remember to use the QLC method for both the evidence pair and the vocab question. Okay, this evidence pair is hard. The question wants to know why John Reed feels justified in his abuse of the narrator. Let's go to the line references. The first one kind of sounds like abuse. You ought to beg. But I'm confused by the rest of it. That's okay, it's related enough that I'll keep it. Line reference B also sounds like abuse. I'll teach you to rummage my bookshelf. That sounds like a threat. I still don't fully understand it, but again, I'll leave it in. Line reference C is obviously wrong. It's a random line, cross it out. Line reference D also sounds like abuse. Take her away, lock her up. I don't get how any of these line references answer the question, but that's okay. Like I said earlier, the no reading strategy can feel scary at times, but if we trust that it works and follow the process, we will get to the answers. The choices will help us. Choice A seems to match with line reference D. Mrs. Reed is definitely ordering someone to do some punishing. Let's keep it in the mix. Choice B is wrong. First of all, the word numerous is pretty strong, and it would make me nervous no matter what the rest of the choice said. Line reference A sounds a little like an insult, but I'd want to know who is doing the insulting. This is a case where we might read beyond the line reference, even though we don't normally need to for evidence questions. I read more when a line reference is a quote and I need to know who's speaking, or if there's a pronoun that I need to identify. I'll just tell you that John is speaking here, so it's not the narrator who is saying these insults. We can get rid of choice B, but we need to keep line reference A in case it matches something else. Choice C also could be right. Rightful master matches with line reference B pretty closely. All the house belongs to me. Let's keep this one too. Choice D might have felt good in the past, but hopefully you're starting to notice how bad a choice like this actually is. 
We have the strong word stole, which seems to match with rummage in line reference B, but there's a big gap between stealing something and rummaging through some books. We also don't have any evidence that the books are valuable, so that's another strong word. Remember, these words really need to be justified by something in the lines as much as possible. So I guess that leaves us with two possible pairs of answers, choice A with line reference D and choice C with line reference B. This happens a lot, and sometimes you just need to trust your instincts and pick the one that seems to answer the question better. But there's one strategy that can help us here. If you're really good at the no reading strategy, you'll look ahead to question 10 and notice that it's about line 72. According to the chronology rule, the line reference for number 9 should come before the line reference for number 10. Line reference B is line 60 to 62, but line reference D is 99 to 102, which would break the chronology rule by going out of order. As I've said, sometimes the SAT breaks this rule, but if I'm genuinely stuck between these two answers, I would put my money on the rule. If it works 85% of the time, line reference B is the smarter bet. And choice C and line reference B are in fact the right answers. If we were to read a bit more around line reference D, we'd see that Mrs. Reed is actually ordering the servants to punish Jane. The fact that it says four hands is kind of suspicious, and I would have read a bit more to clear up that confusion if I had the full passage. For question 10, we want to read the line reference with a blank. This one is hard to come up with a guess. Before, we were able to steal words from the line, but this sentence is structured differently. They seem to be making a contrast. The terror had passed, but other feelings started, began. Sometimes our guesses are kind of messy, but that's okay. We just do the best we can. Choice A is a weird word. Maybe you don't know what it means. That's okay too. Leave it in and move on. Choice B we do know, and we know that conquering does not mean starting. Neither does abandoned, and neither does accomplished. This happens sometimes where we don't know a word, but we end up picking it because all the words we do know end up being wrong. Ensued means started, or came about. Don't be afraid of words that you don't know. Just put them aside and work with what you do know. So it seems like we're done, but wait, we skipped a question. Don't forget to go back to the whole passage question and give it a try. Now, I did give you the full passage because I want to show you what we've read. But do not read the passage. Just notice that the darkened lines are the ones we've already seen through the other questions. We've read a lot of the beginning and then little chunks of the middle and end. I'd say that's about 50% of the passage. You might also notice that we read this passage in order. Here's where we found the answers to all the questions, and notice that they follow the chronology rule. Now we're going to try the whole passage question, and this is where we'll really put the no reading strategy to the test. Most tutors tell their students to read the passage and summarize the entire thing or every single paragraph before they even look at the questions. That is so stupid and unnecessary. Don't do that. First of all, if you didn't understand the passage, you won't really be able to summarize it in much detail. But even if you did, then it's likely your summary will include lots of information that isn't relevant to any of the questions. Look at all those gaps in the passage that we didn't bother to read. Why bother including them in your summary? Instead, we're going to use dumb summaries to get the most basic version of the passage that we can. I'm not looking for anything complicated. You don't need to write an essay on the passage. Just think about the stuff that you saw again and again. Remember, main ideas are repeated ideas. In this case, our dumb summary could just be, Jane does not like John. That's it. We read a story about two characters who don't get along. We really don't need anything more complicated than that. The dumber your summary, the better. We're still going to be able to answer this question because of the 50% rule. Generally speaking, if you read 50% of a passage, you'll understand enough to answer the main idea questions. So pause the video and give this one a try. You're still going to use process of elimination to narrow your focus to the words and phrases in the choices. Okay, you probably noticed that a lot of these choices were partially correct. In choice A, it's true that the passage starts with information about the narrator's past, but it never gets into another character's future. It seems like everything we read happened in the past. Choice B is totally wrong. It's never about educational habits, and I don't think there's a satisfying or positive exchange that we read. 
Now, it's possible that we missed it, but if it's a main idea, it's unlikely we would have been unlucky enough to read everything except the satisfying exchange. They don't bury main ideas in one random line. They repeat them all over the passage. Choice C seems a little true. We definitely get Jane's inner thoughts because she's the narrator. But I don't think we have observations by other characters. The entire passage is from Jane's point of view, so that doesn't seem quite right. But let's look at D and see if it's any better. We definitely have a description of a character because we had a bunch of other questions about that. And maybe you don't know what an altercation is, but it definitely seems like the passage is about something going on between John and the narrator. That's good enough to pick this. And an altercation is a fight, so that also matches with our dumb summary. The reason we don't need to write our own elaborate summary is that the whole passage questions give us four possible summaries in the choices. Don't write your own summary, just analyze the ones you're given using process of elimination and strong words. Even without reading the passage, the odds are very good that you'll be able to understand the main ideas to get these questions right. And with all that time you save, you can always go back and read more if you're not sure. That's why the no reading strategy works. So let's look at it one more time. As we saw, going question by question lets us narrow our focus to just a few lines at a time. Process of elimination narrows your focus to just a few words in each choice. The no reading strategy also saves time because, as we saw, if you only read 50% of the passage, you'll still have a good enough sense of the main ideas to answer the whole passage questions. And since we have the QLC method for every question type, we won't get frustrated by reading and rereading when we're confused. Every step of the QLC method gives us a task to focus on. And if we know to watch out for strong words, then we'll be able to avoid the SAT's trap answers. But of course, this could fail, and we could miss something important. It happens. But the best part of the no reading strategy is that you can always read more if you need to. My lesson forced you to do it my way, but normally you'll have the full passage to fall back on. And I know it's still scary, but I promise that it gets easier. Go try it on a practice section, but don't give up on the no reading strategy as soon as you feel unsure. Push through, trust the strategy, trust yourself, like I said at the beginning, I use the no reading strategy when I take SATs. I promise that it works, you just need to get used to it. If you want more practice with the no reading strategy or any of the strategies that we talked about, make sure you purchase a full copy of my SAT reading and writing packet study guide. I also have a study guide for the math section of the test. Both books are available on Amazon.com in paperback and ebook formats. And remember to visit SattelTutoring.com for even more SAT prep resources. I'm Mike Sattel, thanks for watching, and I hope you learned something.